Welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Cameron Payne is a New York Knick. I'll get into what that means for the Knicks, for Deuce McBride, for everyone involved, how he might fit with the team. Plus, getting into some of the Summer League Game 1 highlights from the young Knicks and what we can expect going into Games 2 and 3 on a back-to-back -back right now on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right. Welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down. The sports stop sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And I want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day, whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube. We appreciate you making us a part of your daily routine. Make sure you hit that auto download function on your favorite podcast app or the notification bell on YouTube so you never miss an episode. I'm Alex Wolf. I'm editor in chief at Knicks site, The Strickland. And uh, you might notice I'm a little, little nasally today, maybe sound not quite on top of my game. I, I am suffering from. Uh, uh, COVID that I picked up on the, the back half of my uh, vacation that I was just on. So I was just on a family trip, got home, got given the gift of COVID. So powering through, doing my flu game today. But if I sound a little nasally or a little sniffly at any point today, I apologize for that. But there's news to get into. So I'm not going to, you know, not going to set this one out. There's too much to talk about. So let's talk about the Knicks signing Cameron Payne. So news breaks Monday night. Uh, the Knicks have signed Payne. Uh, it's Apparently a minimum contract, which is worth about $3 million for Cameron Payne with his years of service in the NBA. Um, so the Knicks not using any of their taxpayer mid-level exception on this deal, apparently, which means they still have about $5 million to play with uh, if they want to do that. They also still have Precious Achua that they can sign and, and you know sign for whatever it is that they, they want to sign him for, uh, as long as it keeps them below that second apron of $188.9 million. So the pain signing does not do too much to uh, affect that hard cap situation. They were going to need to sign, you know, some players to fill that those spots out anyway. I'll get to it in a minute. It does sort of throw some things in the air as far as like how many roster spots are left versus how much money is still left to dole out, all that stuff. There's There's some questions that are starting to come up about, you know, if the Knicks are still, it seems like they're probably looking at a trade of some sort to address their center spot. But let's talk about Cameron Payne first and just kind of what he might bring to the Knicks. So average 7.4 points, 2.6 assists last season uh, in total. He started the season with Milwaukee and then got traded to Philly uh, at the trade deadline, I believe, or maybe even a little before the trade deadline. He did average uh, 9.3 points and 3.1 assists in Philly for a little over half the season. So that's promising that he did better once he went to Philly. Shot 43% overall, 39% from three, and 87% from the free throw line. So those are all good numbers. Uh, he's honestly a great three-point shooter at this point in his career. He shot 36.9% from three for his career. His career high was 44% in Phoenix in 2021, or 2020 to 21. Um, he did shoot, I think, technically speaking, like 50% at one point, but he only played eight games the one year for Phoenix and then was hurt, so don't really count that. But he shot 43% on pull-up threes last year per NBA stats. That's also a great stat to have. Um, you know, you love a guy that can just come down and, you know, create his own his own look that way and, you know, shoot a pull-up or whether that's just getting a quick screen and then being able to get over the screen and take a pull-up three. You know, it's a valuable skill in today's NBA, uh, certainly one that, kind of burned the Knicks in the playoffs last year. So, uh, you know, when when Payne was playing for the Sixers. So, uh, you know, he managed to utilize that skill to great effect, I think. He doesn't get to the rim a lot, uh, at least not last year, nor finish well there, which probably could be something that keeps him as a breaking case emergency player with Tibbs because Tibbs likes a guy that can break down a defense, get all the way to the rim, and then create opportunities for others or finish himself there out of his point guard. So, that might uh that might limit Payne's ceiling with the Knicks a little bit. Yeah, last year he shot 46.7% inside of 10 feet, which is really ugly. I mean, usually inside of 10 feet, especially at the rim, you want guys shooting more like 60%, something like that. 
uh, if not more. And uh, he only ma managed 156 attempts inside of 10 feet last year, but took 286 threes. So maybe that was just him being typecast a certain way by the Bucks and Sixers, though. Uh, he did. Uh, he's had years where he finished above 60% at the rim, uh, only on about an attempt per game. So, you know, not a huge sample size, but still uh, shot 60% at the rim uh, in his best season with Phoenix. And his assist percentage is almost never below 20%. And sometimes tops 30%. His last two years in Phoenix, he had a assist percentage over 30%. So he's good at finding open teammates if he does uh, you know, create that that separation and you know is able to get into the paint and whatever. He's able to kick it out or you know, find rollers, whatever, which is pretty solid. And honestly, I'd figured the Sixers would probably try to bring Payne back, but I guess their loss is the Knicks gain. Um, you know, the Knicks now can get some insight into nick nurse's locker room which is great i think if you're looking at this in terms of like what uh it, you know what this brings other than just the player you know you're, you're getting a guy that was on philly last year a team that you know was a tough first round matchup for the knicks who presumably once they fill out their depth you know which is still an open question but you know at, at least in top level talent got much better this offseason getting paul george and now having him beat paul george and tyrese maxi is like their big three uh, now you've got a little more insight into a division rival and, you know, a team that is going to be right there near the top of the East with you, uh, hopefully, as well as Boston. So it, it seems pretty consensus that the three teams out of the Atlantic division are going to be three of the top teams in the East next year. Uh, so you want to have as much intel on them as you can. Um, but also, I think it was just kind of a a pretty low risk signing for the Knicks. He's, he's a good vet. He steps up in big moments in the playoffs. We saw that in Phoenix, you know, when they were making their run to the finals, he was a pretty key player there. And last year with Philly against the Knicks, he had some big moments uh, in the playoffs. So, you know, having a player like that, never a bad thing, uh, you know, and, and as a sort of 13th to 15th man, you know, that you have on the bench, I think you could do a lot worse, you know, if, than having a campaign there who's a legit NBA player who's, you know, scored in double digits in, in his career and is a high, you know, high percentage three-point shooter. I, I think that you could do a lot worse. I think this is a really good signing for them. You know, I, I think it's fair to wonder what this means for Deuce McBride's future and if Deuce is now being shopped to try to get that center depth that the Knicks need. I know Walker Kessler has come up a bunch, so possibly that means that Deuce is going to be included in a Walker Kessler deal. Maybe this is insurance that the Knicks are signing to kind of get ready for that. Um, it's tough to totally say, uh, but you know, I, I think no matter what, the Knicks got themselves an NBA player, a good NBA player on a veteran contract. He also has rapport with Mikhail Bridges from their time in Phoenix. So, you know, I think that I, I think things are looking pretty good for the Knicks as far as depth goes. Uh, I will say this also, maybe, and I mean, I'll talk about Rokas and just the Rokas Jokobitis in just a second when I talk about the summer league stuff, but uh. You know, I, I think this maybe decreases the chances of the Knicks signing Rokas and bringing him over to the NBA this year, which could mean Summer League is kind of being used as a means to shop Rokas's draft rights for that center depth too. Because the Knicks right now, by my count, are at 13 standard contracts. Uh, they still have Kevin McCullough Jr. on sign. So I think they might be waiting to figure out where the, all the chips fall as far as whether they sign him to a two-way deal or whether they sign him to a uh, full NBA contract for this year. But, and I mean, certainly not playing in Summer League is not helping his leverage at all uh, as far as being able to leverage out a, a full NBA deal this year. But as of right now, my count is they have, and I mean, this is assuming they sign McCuller, which I, I think that they definitely will. I don't think there's any chance they don't do that. But currently their depth chart is looking like Jalen Brunson, Deuce McBride, Campaign, and Tyler Kolak at the point guard spot. Of course, you could slot Deuce kind of in as like a combo guard. Then you have Mikhail Bridges and Dante DiVincenzo, a shooting guard. You have OG Ananobi, uh, Keta bates Yap at uh, the small forward spot. Also, Pekom Dadie and McCuller, in theory, uh, at those at that spot as well. Then you have Julius Randle and Josh Hart at the power forward spot. And Mitchell Robinson, Jericho Sims, and Ariel Huckaporti at the center spot. So, pretty, uh, pretty like guard-stacked rotation. At the moment, it just doesn't seem to leave a lot of room for a uh, Rokas Jokobitis to come over and sign and be part of that team. So I guess we'll see where things fall. Obviously, if you trade Deuce, 
for that center depth, then maybe that opens up that spot and you say, okay, let's let's bring on you know Rokas to kind of take that do spot. I saw some stuff in summer league that makes me think that maybe uh, Rokas might be ready for that. So I'll get into that in just a sec. And uh, when I get into going through summer league and what we've seen out of Dadie, Kolek, Jokobitis, Huck Porty, and then just a couple other notes and stuff to get you ready for games two and three because the Knicks have a back to back today and tomorrow. So get into that in just a sec. But first, I got to let you all know about our friends over at FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. And right now, I mean, I'm looking at New York Knicks uh, at Brooklyn Nets this afternoon. Later this afternoon, the Knicks are actually one and a half point underdogs uh, right now. So, uh, you know, you can bet the Knicks plus one and a half at minus 102 odds right now or plus 116 if you just go money line. I mean, I don't know. It's summer league. Anything can happen. Uh, I think I think I would bet on the Knicks in this case, plus 116 to win this game. I don't know who the Nets have on their summer league team that is exactly scaring me enough to think that they will beat the Knicks for sure. So I, I would say bet on the Knicks. Uh, go for it. That's something to do this summer. But they're also running some uh, 30% profit boosts on the WNBA right now. So if you want to bet on some WNBA, Liberty Action, something like that, definitely lots of great stuff to check in on at FanDuel right now. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, and I'm back in to now talk about the Knicks Summer League, uh, their Summer League debut. I wanted to get this episode out yesterday, so apologies for that. Um, but, you know, COVID, all that. But the Knicks lost their first Summer League game uh, this past weekend, 94-90 to to the Hornets. So what I'm going to do is kind of go over the key rookies and, you know, how they played. Well, and also Rokas Jokobitis, who's not a – well, I guess he would be a rookie if he comes over this year. Not his first Summer League appearance, but um, – talk about how everybody fared and then kind of lay out what I want to see from them in games two and three. The Knicks play the Nets this afternoon and then the Kings tomorrow afternoon. So uh, back to back for them before they finish up, I believe, against Detroit on Friday. And then, you know, depending on where they're at, I think every team ends up in the in like the playoff for Summer League now. I think it's just a giant tournament. So the Knicks will be like in the playoffs no matter what. But we'll see how they end up doing these last few games. But first, let's talk about Paco Mdadie. So Paco ended up with five points, five rebounds, two assists, two turnovers, two of eight shooting, and 0 of three from three in the first game against the Hornets. But honestly, I think it was a really misleading stat line for him. I, I don't think that the box score tells the story with him at all. I really thought that he popped pretty well. Um, he stood out to me a lot watching this game. You know, I think that when you're looking at a guy like this who's – so young and you know is coming from european basketball at such a young age and then coming over to the u.s getting his first taste of nba basketball i think this is uh it was as good of a debut as you could have hoped for from him so first off i think the defense was what really popped to me first i thought he played some really good one-on-one -on -one defense with brandon miller and he had that assignment like for most of the game whenever they were sharing the floor together pack home was basically on brandon miller which i thought you know, that was probably something that Dice Yoshimoto, the uh, the summer league coach, one of Tibbs' assistants. That's probably something that Tibbs communicated to Dice, and then Dice communicated to Packholm. Like, we want you, you know, guarding the other the other team's best player. You know, this is what we're going to try to get you used to. Um, you know, for your potential role in the NBA going forward. You know, I think that Packholm, because of where this team is at, and you know where they are with with contention status, and now how loaded the roster is. It's going to be a while before he sees like real NBA minutes. So I think that they're going to use whatever opportunities they can to kind of get him on, get him on the best players that they can. You know, and I'm sure he's going to spend some time with the Westchester Knicks this year and they're going to have him guarding the best assignment on any other team. Just because I think that the ideal for him is like, and I saw this throughout this game, I think the ideal for him is that you, you have a, uh, a three and D player on your hands that could potentially be more if he, you know, develops other aspects of his game. But I definitely see 
a for sure outline of a three and D player with this guy. So he, he was on Brandon Miller. I thought he did a really good job on Miller. I mean, Miller still got some of his looks to fall, but like he's an NBA level scorer. It's a guy that averaged 17 points a game as a rookie in the NBA this past year. Like, like he's a legit NBA scorer. So to run up against someone like that in your very first game is, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough ask. You know, it's a tough ask when it's your first summer league game and it's a guy that probably shouldn't even be in summer league. Like I don't fully, I guess it's just because it's a new regime and everything in Charlotte that they wanted him to, they wanted Miller to come in. You know, it, from what I understand based off the broadcast, he's just going to play that first game and then Miller's done, you know, after this one game against the Knicks. So, you know, he's still got his shots to fall and whatever, but that's a guy that probably shouldn't be in summer league that Dottier then had to guard. I thought he did a really good job, though. Like, some of the one-on-one -on -one sequences, he stuck with him so well. He showed really good lateral agility, which I thought was a plus. Um, he did a good job of contesting, always keeping his hands up and out, and, you know, trying to predict what Miller was doing with the ball, and did a good job, I think, working to get over screens. You know, obviously, every rookie can learn to be better at that, of getting over screens on defense, but I thought he did a really good job of, of – you know, showing a, a good first effort there. So I, I really like this defense. You know, I, he got he got cooked a little bit once or twice by Miller, you know, but that's just because Miller's a really good NBA level scorer. And, you know, he's going to do that against really good defense anyway because he can just score. So, um, but yeah, I, I think that the defense was definitely what stood out to me the most with Dottier. But the offense was really good too. Like I wouldn't read too much into the O of three from three. Um, they looked really ugly on on TV, um, you know, he straight up airballed them uh, and he took above the break threes. So I, I think the important thing to consider here when you watch it, all of his shots were falling about a foot short. And uh, if you're not familiar, the NBA three point line is 23 feet, nine inches versus the FIBA line, uh, which is 22 feet, two inches. So go figure. All of his threes were falling about a foot short because he's used to shooting above the break threes that are about a foot shorter. I think that that's just going to come with reps. You know, he's just got to get used to that NBA three-point line. But the form looked good. You know, the decision-making was good. The shots were all wide open. Like, I, I don't have any issue with him taking the shots that he took. It wasn't like he was chucking or anything. They were good in-rhythm shots, I think. Um, you know, they just were really short because I just don't think that he's used to the NBA three-point line yet. So that'll be something that we'll see over time, I think, get better. Um, you know, we didn't really – I. If I recall correctly, I think all three of his threes were above the break as well, so he didn't get to see him from the corners. But I'd be curious if they try to float Dottier out to the corners a little bit in these next couple of games just to you know, get him some looks that he's more used to because uh, the corner three in NBA and FIBA is only separated by like a couple inches, I think. So that's more normal. That's more what he's used to versus the above the break one, which is like a solid foot longer than you know the threes that he's used to taking. Um, so I, I wouldn't read too much into the into the shooting. Uh, but his passing was, I think, better than expected, too. I, I believe it was uh, Huck Porty that he hit out of a pick and roll at one point that really caught my eye. Like he he or uh, it could have been someone else. But either way, he ran a pick and roll at one point, showed a lot of patience getting into the lane um, and then just swung a really nice pass and, and got a finish out of it. So overall, like. I'd give him like a solid like seven out of ten just based on the eye test, you know, for how his debut went. The only thing that could have been better, obviously, is if he made more shots. But I think he made good decisions. I think the outline is there. I think the process is good. Um, you know, I I think that he could really be a three and D guy if he extends his range out to the NBA three, and then if the handling and the ability to run occasional pick and roll and stuff continues progressing, then he could potentially be a, a really high impact NBA player when he reaches his, when he you know. He's now 19, I believe, or he's going to be 19 when the season starts. I mean, if he hits his age 21, 22 season, you know, like his third season or so in the NBA, you know, and third, you know, third season on his rookie deal, and then starts really asserting himself for, you know, playing time on this Knicks team that will still have all their Villanova guys and you know whoever else in a couple years from now, uh, you know, I think there's a there's a chance that he, you know, especially if he continues growing too, which we don't know where. I, I don't know like what his status has been, if he's still growing or if he seems to have roughly hit his, you know, final height or whatever. But if he keeps growing and he could potentially turn into like kind of a four ish, like a three, four tweener that could play good defense, hit the three, handle the ball a little bit. I see a pretty good outline for him. So 
I would say goals for games two and three for me, for him, just keep the process good. Hopefully he'll get at least his one signature summer league game where he drops like 20 points and just keep getting up those NBA threes in practice. I think he'll be in good shape. Um, I want to talk about Tyler Kolek, Rokas Jokobitis, Ariel Hawk Porty, and uh, just some of the other players on the team real quick. So I'll get into that in the next segment and uh, get ready for you know the game against the Nets today. But first, I want to let you all know about our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the price you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. All right, so let's continue getting through some of these game one uh, performances by the Knicks from Summer League and, and what to expect in games two and three. So Tyler Kolek probably was the guy that stood out the most, uh, definitely the guy that was most talked about. I want to start with Dottie just because he was I, – I think that he was the guy that if you just looked at the box score, you'd be the most fooled about how well he played. But uh, Kolek, box score and on the on the screen, popped big time. Uh, seven points, seven rebounds seven assists, no turnovers. He was the only player in the positive in plus minus with a plus nine, and that really showed. I mean, the team definitely ran better with him on the floor. I mean, he was he was straight up floor general. I mean, he was running out of the pick and roll, finding shooters on the outside. He was finding guys off the roll, had really great timing. I mean, I just I think he really knows what he's doing as far as running an offense, and that's super, super clear. Um, you know, and probably why the Knicks were so quick to – lock him in on what is as of right now the biggest uh second round contract in terms of guaranteed money that's ever been handed out so i think he does exactly what tibbs likes out of a guard he can get inside and then kind of spray it out to shooters and really good at a pick and roll i i think he has good timing getting all the way towards the rim before making his decision and then you know he either passes it out to a to someone on the outside or to a trailer, uh, he hit Huck Porty, you know, once or twice this way. Uh, I think he he hit Dottier on a cut at one point, if I'm not mistaken. But he just made some really good passes out of pick and roll and, and hitting cutters or just guys that were trailing behind. He just had like really really good timing as far as that's concerned. Um, I think he really knows what he's doing as far as you know running running a team, running an offense, keeping everybody organized. Um, you know, being the guy that kind of stirs the drink there, and I, I think he. Easily could have had 10-plus assists in this game, too, if the team just shot a little better as a whole. Um, on the overall, I think they shot like 30% from three or something like that and like 40% overall. So, yeah, it's uh, it was definitely a really good game for Kolek. I mean, I, I, I think the rebounding was really good, too. He has good timing about where to get, like where to stand to, to get a rebound. It wasn't all necessarily just like that his bigs were boxing out and he just kind of walked into rebounds. Like he had a, he, I think just had a good innate sense for where the ball was going to come off and then was really good at starting the break off that too. It was just a really, really impressive first game for Kolek. You know, I kind of wonder if at a certain point, the Knicks are going to kind of limit how much he plays just because I, I think he's already arguably a little too good for summer league. Um, you know, his, his shooting was not the best uh, in you know, the first game, I think he shot two of six, but, you know, he, he wasn't really being counted on to shoot. He was being counted on to set up his teammates and stuff. And I, I think that he did that in spades. So I guess my goals for him for games two to three, just kind of keep it going. I think he's already proved what he can do. Uh, maybe try to work a little more off ball to prove he can be out there with Brunson potentially, you know, whether it's this year or in the future uh, when he, you know, manages to crack the Knicks rotation, which I think, I think at this point it feels like a when, not an if. Uh, I think that he looks really good. I mean, you know, talking about the campaign signing, maybe that's going to be an interesting battle to watch of if Payne, you know, the veteran, gets more of a look or if Kolek gets more of a look in, like, the preseason and then the early parts of the season as far as the, 
you know, I think the Deuce will get some sort of hybrid one, two minutes. If again, if he's still on the team, if he's not ultimately moved to like fix the center depth and all that, I think it'd be interesting to see the battle between Kolek and Payne as far as who gets some of those like backup point guard minutes. But Kolek, you know, defensively, I think similar to Brunson, he, he tries hard and I think he's got some decent instincts, but it's going to be held back by his size. Uh, but offensively, I think he he does everything you would want for a bench unit. Like you want your bench unit to kind of hit hard, to run, to you know play fast, and I think he would mesh really well with like Divincenzo and Hart, for example. Which again, it's still kind of crazy to think about. Like those guys are going to be coming off the bench this year, but they are, uh, and I think that he would work really well with those two, with Deuce McBride, uh, you know, with if Presh Tachua is back. I think that like those guys as a five man unit could be really dangerous. Just because they would just run, 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 and they have plenty of shooting out there. Uh, I think that could be a really cool lineup to potentially look at. So, yeah, for Kolek, just keep it up. You know, keep uh, showing what you got. And I, I think by game four, you know, he might not play a ton because I, I think that they're probably going to look to, uh, you know, preserve him a little bit at that point, having already kind of seen what he's capable of. So then... Next, let's talk about Rokas. Uh, Rokas Jokobitis. He ends with eight points, two boards, one assist, one steal, three turnovers, which is not the best, but shot three, six from the field. I got to say, first thing that stands out with him, his mid range pull up is just super automatic. Like it's super easy for him to get to, and he just makes that shot. So that's, that's kind of Brunson esque in a way. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of Brunson in Jokobitis' game uh, with how he approaches it and how how he's able to kind of work on and off ball. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying that Jokobitis is going to turn into Brunson because Brunson's like a top five NBA player now at this point. But I think that he made a, a really good case for being able to play with Brunson in that when he played with Kolek, he was, he was pretty good on and off ball, I think, um, and really had good instincts no matter what his role was on offense. Um, and as I said, that, that mid range pull up is just really automatic. So if he was like running a bench unit or something, I could see that being a, a go-to shot for him. And he also had good instincts about kind of getting to that spot. Like I think that the passing was really good. He had a couple passes that probably could have resulted in assists, but just weren't the shots weren't made, but he had a really nice look out to the corner off a quick pick and roll where he kind of drew in the defense on the threat of that mid-range shot and then just kicked it over to the corner. I forget who the shooter was, but they ultimately missed it. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a good look by Jokobitis. So I, I think that the passing instincts are there and some of what he's learned in Europe over the last couple of years is definitely showing through. Um, I also thought he was pretty solid on defense. Like when Packholm was sitting down a couple times, he drew Miller. Uh, Brandon Miller a couple times, and I think he held his own against him pretty well. He made some smart decisions, uh, switching as well when he needed to off ball. I mean, I, I think that he just showed solid defensive instincts and defensive ability and, you know, was able to keep Miller in front of him, get good contests on him. Uh, so I, I like what I saw from him in that regard. I, th I feel like that's probably one of the sort of questions uh, for him. Um going into the summer league is like how's his defense and how how would he do with or without the ball and i think he did a pretty good job of answering a lot of that in the first game i think he's solid on defense he can work with or without the ball i really like him as a prospect i i it's becoming increasingly difficult to see a world where he's on the knicks this year but it's a shame because i would love if they could bring him over because i i do really think i see the outlines of a good nba player here it's also tough to say like he wasn't aggressive enough or anything i i wish that i'd seen him more with the ball in his hands and able to run the offense more and stuff but he only played 14 minutes he did share some of those with kolek and kolek was running the show no matter what in those minutes which you know it's tough to argue against that considering how good kolek played but i think Rokas really looked he looked a lot better than his first summer league appearance a couple years ago. I mean his first game when he uh, when he played in that 2021 summer league it was uh it was pretty rough. Uh I remember watching that and being like, "Ugh, this guy, you know, it, the game is a little too fast for him right now." And he did really well to improve on that in his second summer league game that year uh and you know, now I think he came in he looks a lot better right away so my goal for rokas games two and three just keep proving you belong hopefully you get some more minutes 
you know, later on this summer league, once, if my prediction is right, I think Kolak will start getting less minutes in, in terms of the summer league quote regular season, you know, so just, just keep proving you belong. Hopefully the more minutes will come. And then, you know, when that happens, maybe you, maybe you work your way into a Knicks contract. I mean, I don't know how receptive he would be to potentially being on a two-way deal, but maybe if that's how he gets on the Knicks, maybe that's what Rokas takes this year. Uh, they have, I, I believe, still th- two two-way spots open. Um, so they have Huck Porty on one of them. Uh, so, you know, it's it's going to be interesting. But, I mean, if you could have Huck Porty, Rokas, and McCuller on those three two-way spots, I mean, those that's like some really high upside uh, to have in your two-way spots. So that, that would be pretty sick. If the Knicks could pull that off. Speaking of Huck Porty, uh, he ended up with six points, five boards, two assists, shot three of six against the Hornets. Um, he was probably the guy I came away least impressed with, I think, uh, out of all the rookies or out of all the guys I'm highlighting here. I thought he looked a little slow, if I'm being honest, especially on defense. Might be just an NBA conditioning level kind of problem, but hopefully that'll be solved in time. But, you know, I just think in drop coverage like they're playing they're playing him in tib style drop coverage and that's something he has to learn that's something he has to perfect a lot uh there were a number of times he just didn't shade out to the ball handler enough on pick and roll coverage and it resulted in a made shot and you know that's something that even like mitchell robinson isn't fully immune from you know sometimes we see where he just doesn't get out enough on a shooter and that's just the reality of tibbs's preferred defense is that you're trying to bank on your on your point of attack defender you know, getting over that screen and getting enough of a contest to make it so the ball handlers can't do that. So you can keep your center kind of towards the paint and, uh, you know, able to contest if if that driver decides to drive in. But, you know, I thought that he he in particular just looked a little, little slow with that, um, you know, and, and there's going to be some learning there. But on offense, I thought he was really good. Uh, he had a nice touch finishing, reminded me a little bit of iHeart with his ability to just kind of quickly flip up a shot on the move. Um, but not quite as silky as uh, Isaiah Hartenstein's shots, who has that just automatic floater that we're going to miss a lot this year. But, you know, he, he had some nice little hook shots or whatever. He front-rimmed a couple of them, which was less than ideal, but overall, like, was taking good shots, I think, um, and started to figure it out as the game went on. You know, probably had a little bit of first-game jitters and stuff, but all in all, pretty solid, you know, finishing around the rim, which was good. He set nice screens, which is always a plus. You know, you always want a good hard screen setter, and he definitely did that. So that that was a big plus. He had one really nice short roll pass, too. All in all, I think just kind of had some nice passing, too, just like bailout situations where he got the ball a little too deep or whatever and had to reset the offense. I think he did good with fighting guys that way and, and you know, not uh, making foolish passes out of those situations. So all in all, I think just I came away liking his offensive game. A pretty good amount but as right now i don't see any dark horse mitch backup hype for him because i just don't think he can hold it on defense well enough yet uh so i would say my goal for huck porty games two three work on defensive positioning and your timing as much as you can you know just keep up the good work on the offensive end and keep trying to get better but i would imagine he's probably going to see a good amount of time with the westchester knicks this year because they're going to need to work on work on his defensive timing and stuff like that and hopefully they'll keep him around for big team practices, especially when they're at home so that he can, you know, kind of study Mitchell Robinson and see how he operates and stuff like that. But as of right now, I think, uh, I think he's probably not quite there yet uh, as far as being able to play in the NBA. And then just some other quick notes on other guys, Jacob Toppin, I thought had a really solid game shot two or three from three. Uh, I could probably see him coming back on a two way deal again this year too. So that, you know, further complicates those two way spots, but you know, in a year or two, possibly he could contend for an NBA spot if his shooting is legit, kind of similar to Obi. I also wouldn't be totally surprised if some team comes out and offers Jacob Toppin a, a regular NBA contract this year. You know, maybe a team that is tanking or whatever, like uh, if Utah blows it up or something, I could see them possibly come calling or, uh, I don't know, Washington, you know, a team like that that doesn't have much to play for this year but can – kind of take some time, give him NBA reps and try to develop him a bit. Like there's definitely a a pretty solid outline there with Jacob Toppin. Like I just, I don't think he's quite ready yet. And, you know, he came into the league much younger than his brother. So he was, he was much younger than Obi coming into the NBA, but I I could see him being kind of a similar player uh, in the long run. If he can get that three point shot consistent at the NBA level. 
then uh, we didn't get to see much of Justin Lewis or Devin Kennedy. So hopefully we'll get to see more of them as the summer league goes on. Those also possible two-way contract prospects. You know, there's a lot of guys, I think, that are fighting for two-way spots on this Knicks team right now. So I'd love to see some more out of those guys. And then just shout out to Dwayne Washington, who balled out down the stretch, but I, I still just don't really see him as an NBA prospect. But he he definitely was the offensive star for the Knicks in this game. He had over 20 points, made a lot of threes, all that good stuff. So, uh, But, yeah, now we've got the, the upcoming games here. Uh, we got Brooklyn today on Tuesday and then tomorrow uh, Sacramento. So we'll get to see a lot more of these young players. We'll have a cover for you guys on Locked on Knicks. But until then, thank you all for listening, and I'll talk to you soon. Peace out, everybody.